Well, good morning. I appreciate uh, the kind invitation uh, from uh, Jesse Van Toll and John Taylor to be here with you this morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to discuss how we can preserve what is working well with the Community Reinvestment Act and think about ways to make it even better. In recent months, we've seen a very high level of engagement from banks and community organizations in discussions and comments about revising the CRA regulations. And that just serves as a testament to the value of CRA and provides great suggestions for improving our regulatory approach. The one message that comes through most clearly is that the CRA is highly valued by bankers and community groups alike. A second message is that the CRA could be even more effective in mobilizing community and economic development. So before I offer some thoughts on what we've learned and some possible ways forward, I want to just begin by recalling why the CRA was established and what it was designed to achieve, as well as the important role it has played for over 40 years in low and moderate income communities all around our country. The CRA, as all of you know, was one of several landmark pieces of legislation to address inequities in the credit markets in the wake of the civil rights movement. Following passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act in 1974, and the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act in 1975, Congress passed CRA in 1977 to address the credit needs of low and moderate income neighborhoods. With the passage of CRA, Congress was aiming to reverse the disinvestment from years of market actions and government policies that deprived lower income areas of credit by redlining, using red inked lines to set apart neighborhoods that were deemed too risky. The CRA is unique in important ways. Unlike previous government efforts to address the needs of low income communities, CRA puts decision making about a community's needs and priorities in the hands of local actors. By stipulating that banks have an affirmative and continuing obligation to meet the credit needs of all segments of the local communities they are chartered to serve, including low and moderate income communities, the CRA changed the way banks approach their lending and investment decisions in those communities. More than 40 years later, the CRA continues to animate a vibrant community development ecosystem, connecting community members together with the banks that lend and invest, community organizations that deliver services and develop housing, and state and local governments that direct incentives and subsidies. We participate actively in that ecosystem through our community development and examination staff around the country. A second unique feature of CRA is the public nature of evaluations. The CRA directs federal regulators to evaluate banks' records of helping to meet the credit needs of their local communities and assign one of four statutorily mandated ratings and the analysis supporting them. That public nature of CRA evaluations provides a strong incentive for good performance as well as a platform for public input. Beyond that, Congress largely left to the banking agencies the ability to describe in regulations how they would evaluate bank CRA performance. This flexibility is very valuable because it enables the agencies to revise those implementing uh, regulations from time to time to keep CRA relevant in response to technical, technological innovation and other changes in the landscape. The agencies have discussed revising the CRA regulations on and off since 2010, when interagency hearings were held across the country. Last August, the OCC issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to re request comment on a variety of questions. And as was mentioned earlier, the OCC received nearly 1,500 comment letters in response to the ANPR. And we have been reading those letters with great interest. To augment that analysis, since October, the Federal Reserve System has held more than 25 outreach meetings across the country with banks and community organizations, including representation from the other banking agencies, culminating with an in-depth research symposium at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia 
uh, which I attended and which was very high quality. Several themes are emerging from the comment letters and outreach. Perhaps most important, stakeholders overwhelmingly support the CRA and its goals, noting a significant increase in loans and investments in low and moderate income communities since the law's enactment. Many commenters emphasize the central role of CRA in supporting a vital community development ecosystem and cautioned us to proceed with care so as not to disturb this important ecosystem. I share this commitment to CRA and to strengthening its role in community and economic development in the low and moderate income communities where it can make the greatest difference. Banks and community organizations also agree that the regulation should better reflect the way in which banking products and services are currently delivered. Much has changed since the last major revision to the CRA regulations, which took place at a time when physical branches were essential for all deposit and lending needs of bank customers. The current definition of a bank's assessment area, the area in which a bank's performance is assessed, relies on branches and deposit-taking ATMs as a proxy for where banks are gathering its deposits. The internet was just becoming available for commercial use when the current assessment area regulations were put in place. Since that time, of course, technology and changing consumer preferences have led to banks gathering deposits and making loans well outside their physical branches, online, and via mobile devices. Clearly, it is time to better define the area in which the agencies evaluate a bank's CRA activities, but it's important to retain that critical focus on the credit needs of local communities. As tempting as it may be to think that digital channels have rendered bank branches unnecessary, my interactions with banks and community stakeholders around the country just underscored the importance of those branches as the places that provide the personal face-to-face -face assistance valued by many consumers and business customers. Moreover, branches provide a local presence for lenders to get to know the borrowers and the communities in which they lend, live, and invest. While technology has much to offer by way of convenience and customer experience, it's often a complement to rather than a replacement for bank branches. For this reason, and to be true to the original intent of the law, I believe that CRA evaluations should retain a focus on the credit needs of the local communities banks serve as indicated by their physical presence. Each quarter, I travel around the country to visit a low and moderate income community with the board and reserve bank community development staff. On these visits, I see firsthand the tremendous success of CRA in bringing banks to the table with other stakeholders to address complex community needs. For instance, I met with bankers in Denver, Colorado, who were working with local government officials and local nonprofits to maintain affordable housing near newly developed public transit lines. In North St. Louis, I met with a community bank that was working with a place-based community development organization called Better Family Life to develop a micro-loan fund that is empowering low-income entrepreneurs locally. In other places, particularly in high poverty and rural areas, I see firsthand the importance of access to basic banking services. In a visit to the Mississippi Delta in 2016, I heard from community members about having to drive long distances to deposit a check or access an ATM. The same was true in my visits to Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and towns in parts of the Appalachian region of Kentucky. There's a complex balance between banks' need to operate their branches profitably and communities needs to connect to the financial mean stream, which we want to recognize in any revisions to the CRA regulations. Bankers, as well as other commenters, have emphasized the high value that bank branches have for retail cu customers and small business owners in underserved communities, and research corroborates this. Similar to banks, community organization commenters support updating the CRA regulations as they relate to a bank's assessment area, and suggest retaining assessment areas around a bank's branches in order to retain that focus on local low and moderate income neighborhoods. 
while addressing areas where banks conduct significant activity without branches as well. Both bank and community organization commenters were open to having a larger area defined for the purposes of pursuing meaningful community development activities, particularly in cases where banks operate largely without branches. By allowing for more activity in a broader geographic area, they argue that the artificial competition for investments in areas served by several banks, such as New York or Salt Lake City, so-called credit hotspots could be mitigated. This could be to the benefit of credit deserts, those perennially underserved rural areas or small metropolitan areas that may not have a bank branch, or if they do, may not constitute a major market for purposes of bank's CRA evaluations. In reflecting on these suggestions, we've been considering an approach that would rework the assessment area definition so that banks of a certain scale might have a separate assessment area for their retail activities and their community development activities. This dual assessment area approach would retain the law's focus on the credit needs of a bank's local community by evaluating retail lending and services in the county or other geographic areas surrounding its branches, deposit-taking ATMs, and other concentrations of lending and deposit-taking. And separately, a bank would get CRA consideration for community development activities in a more expansive area. Under the current rule, there's no ex ante certainty that a bank's community development activities will receive CRA consideration if they are in that broader statewide or regional area. The current approach has proven challenging in practice as banks sometimes invest in a community development activity only to find that their examiner doesn't agree that the activity is located within their assessment area. A more expansive and ex ante clearer community development assessment area definition would afford CRA consideration for any community development activity in a state where a bank has an assessment area. This approach would help eliminate uncertainty and could encourage more capital for affordable housing, community facilities, and economic development activities in underserved areas. A broader assessment area for community development could help address the concentration of investment dollars in metropolitan areas where several banks may have branches, while other smaller metropolitan and rural areas remain chronically underserved. My recent visit to Pine Ridge in South Dakota brought home the importance of addressing these inequities in credit availability that result from the CRA's current assessment area definition. When I met with the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation, I was impressed with their 34-acre mixed-use project to create a new commercial center for the reservation. But in examining a list of all the project funders, it was noticeable that there were active financing commitments from many foundations and nonprofits, but no banks. Although this is likely to be a very impactful investment, there's only one bank currently whose assessment area may extend to Pine Ridge. In contrast, under a possible community development assessment area approach, more of the banks with branches, say, in Aberdeen, South Dakota, might be inclined to make such an investment with confidence it would get CRA consideration. By creating separate assessment areas for retail and community development activities, we believe that banks would continue to place their communities at the center of their retail lending and service activities while participating in meaningful community development opportunities that may have greater impact due to their broader reach. Separately, we've also been contemplating approaches to what community development activities count in order to provide greater predictability and better incentives. Banks and community organizations have noted that the current structure of the large bank performance test may actually hinder community development financing in a few ways. First, under the existing approach, where community development loans are considered under the lending test and investments have a separate test, a number of banks and community organizations argue that the form of community financing may be influenced more by the structure of the CRA rating than what makes most sense for the project. So for example, if a bank is concerned about passing its lending test, it might structure financing as a loan rather than an investment to beef up its performance under that test even if an investment would be more impactful. Second, a number of commenters argued for giving CRA consideration to any community development loan outstanding rather 
than only those originated since the last evaluation. Under the current rules, banks often make short-term renewable community development loans simply to ensure that the incremental lending receives consideration un under CRA. By contrast, when it comes to investments, as you all know, all investments on the bank's book at the time of the evaluation are given consideration. Banks and community organizations have argued compellingly that all types of community development finance, whether in the form of loans or investment, have greater impact when they serve as patient, committed sources of financing. One possible approach to address these distortions and provide more effective incentives is to create a separate comprehensive community development test to evaluate community development loans and investments through a similar lens, possibly along with community development services. A separate comprehensive community development test would arguably provide more encouragement for banks to provide the patient committed financing in the form of loans as well as investments that so many community development organizations value the most. This is important because banks may be uniquely situated to evaluate the community development finance projects in the states where they operate and to provide the smaller, more complex, and often more impactful investments that don't attract institutional investors. If banks can't be uh, confident ex ante that they will get the benefit of CRA consideration, for these efforts, which invariably are time consuming to evaluate and structure, it's not surprising that they would gravitate towards doing those things they know will count. In addition to these broad changes to what and how community development activities should be counted, many commenters advocated for an expansion of the definition of community development to include loans to or investments in CDFIs, regardless of the bank's assessment area because the sole purpose of CDFIs is, after all, community development. There are also suggestions that in high poverty rural areas where incomes overall may be low relative to federal benchmarks, it may be helpful to adjust what qualifies as a low and moderate income community so that more CRA activity receives consideration. These are suggestions that we think merit serious uh, study. The recognition of the variation in how banks deliver their products and services brings me to the third theme expressed by both banks and community organizations, which is the need for CRA regulations to be flexible enough to evaluate banks of widely different sizes and business models. Different perspectives were offered about some aspects of how to better tailor the regulations, particularly with regards to whether more banks should be considered small and as such uh, eligible for a streamlined evaluation. Of course, one of the benefits of creating separate assessment area definitions and performance tests for retail activities and community development activities could be streamlining the tests and applying them in different ways to tailor CRA evaluations to banks based on their size and business models. Small banks could have their lending and retail services evaluated under the retail test, while larger banks could be evaluated under both. The assessment area definition could be flexible enough to allow banks that conduct most or all of their activity online to identify states in which they have a significant level of deposits, lending, or other activity in which they would have an obligation either under the retail or community development test as appropriate. There was also wide support for making CRA definitions and evaluation criteria clearer and taking other actions to approve, improve the consistent and predictable application of the regulations during evaluations. Perhaps most important, the commenter strongly supported the agencies continuing the tradition of working together to have one set of rules, consistent interpretive guidance, and regular examiner training. At the Federal Reserve, we agree that it is important for the banking agencies to speak with one voice on CRA. Finally, there was broad support for expanding the use of metrics in CRA evaluations where appropriate, especially if they're clearly articulated, utilized in tandem with performance context information and add to the transparency of CRA ratings. We recognize that effective and predictable evaluations rely on good metrics. These, in turn, require 
good data. Currently, CRA evaluations utilize Humda data, which are very useful in understanding where mortgages are made, to whom, and at what cost. Moreover, Humda data are collected from both non-banks as well as banks. By contrast, the data collected under CRA to support our analysis of small business and small farm loans is not nearly as comprehensive. Dodd-Frank charges the CFPB with promulgating regulations for the collection of small business loans, and that data should be extremely helpful when it becomes available. Additionally, the data collected under CRA currently is not adequate to support the analysis of a separate community development test, so it may be necessary to consider a better reporting system. Collecting data and developing clear metrics will provide the improved clarity and ex-ante predictability that banks seek. More and better data will allow for meaningful metrics by which we can evaluate performance criteria, such as the borrower and geographic distribution of lending and how a bank's performance compares to other similarly situated banks. We may also consider providing more baseline information regarding the performance context, such as the demographic and economic information that helps to describe the credit needs and opportunities present in each assessment area. In addition, it's worth exploring whether there are ways to more effectively incorporate community engagement into the process. For example, by having the banking agencies develop a joint community contacts database to facilitate access to information from local stakeholders. So I'll briefly sum up by saying that I was very impressed with the number of organizations that took the time to comment on the OCC's ANPR and attend the Federal Reserve's outreach meetings. This is a testament to the high level of commitment to CRA from banks and community organizations alike. As we think about the path forward, it is important that we retain the CRA's core focus on place while also facilitating meaningful assessments of banks that primarily deliver their products and services digitally. We want whatever we design to be clear and more predictable in order to promote more and more impactful CRA activity. Taken together, changes to the CRA regulations that provide for separate retail and community development assessment areas along with separate and more complete retail and community development tests may have the potential to enhance the regulations to better ensure that banks serve their local communities. We appreciate that banks want to be able to make plans and manage their risks carefully through clearer standards regarding what counts, where it will be counted, and how. If we can address these suggestions effectively, banks will be more effective in turn in addressing the needs of their local communities, and in some cases in extending their activities to benefit chronically underserved communities. I will be interested to hear from you whether some of the ideas we've shared today resonate. We'll continue to engage with stakeholders to find a path forward that honors the purpose of the CRA by encouraging banks to attend to the credit needs of their local communities and better address the needs of underserved areas. This engagement will be vital as we join together with the other banking agencies to formulate regulatory changes that preserve what is best about CRA while ensuring its value and relevance for another generation. Thank you very much. So I think I'm gonna take a few questions. Um, I can't see uh, very well from here, so. I'll just rely on the microphone going to the right people. Um, it would be useful just to identify yourself. Good morning, I'm Dori Rand from Woodstock Institute and member of the NCRC board. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate your strong support of CRA. I wanted to follow up on one of the things you mentioned and that was uh, the importance of the regulators speaking with one voice. And I wondered, uh, what do you think the impact on the financial um, institutions would be and on our economy if the OCC were to go ahead alone again on proposed CRA rules? Would we have a race to the bottom like we saw with the OTS, for example? So I think um, one of the things uh, that was uh, clearest 
um, and most uh, kind of widely voiced in the comments, but also in all of the roundtables. Um, I've had the opportunity to hear from uh, some of uh, our bankers um, and community organizations in some of those uh, roundtables. The one consistent message that I heard was that the agencies must go together on any uh, revisions to the regulation. And uh, they did so, I think they voiced that uh, concern because it is uh, by far the most effective and efficient way to promote the kind of um, bank engagement with local communities uh, to address their credit needs that really lies at the heart of the CRA. So I am hopeful. I'm certainly uh, engaging uh, with my um, colleagues. Uh, I know Eric Belsky is engaging uh, as well across the three agencies, and we are uh, very uh, hopeful that we can move forward um, with one set of proposed changes. Sure. I'm uh, Matthew Lee, uh, Inner City Press, Fair Finance Watch, and I'm the uh, chair of the N NCRC Legislative Regulatory Committee. I, I wanted to ask, thanks a lot for coming for, to the conference. Since CRA is, is enforced on uh, merger and expansion applications, and without asking you about any specific recent or upcoming merger application, I wanted to ask you about a problem that's arisen at the Fed. And it's one in which banks, in responding to community groups' comments on mergers or to additional information letters from, from the Fed staff, withhold large portions of their response, uh, black them out, redact them. And groups have a right to see supposedly, under the ex parte rules, to see these responses so they can help the Fed by replying to it and getting more specific about what the issue they were raising is. So groups are then told you should request this blacked out information under the Freedom of Information Act, you submit a request, but that doesn't get ruled on until after the Fed has acted on invariably approving the merger application. So I'm wondering, as a part of, as, as, is, as is related to kind of CRA enforcement and also the Fed hearing from groups, can you look into this problem in terms of at least having the Fed, maybe outside of the FOIA process, respond more quickly to where banks black out whole pages of information about their community lending so that people can actually see what they're saying before the Fed approves? And maybe also not always approving would be good, but the, mostly this informational <laughs> issue is the one I wanted to ask you about. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. So I certainly can say that uh, we will uh, follow up. Uh, generally speaking, uh, as I said uh, uh, earlier, we think one of the unique and valuable aspects of the CRA is its public nature, uh, that we uh, as examiners uh, and regulators are um, uh, directed to uh, make uh, ratings and underlying analysis public, and uh, we certainly are looking for ways to have more public input um, so that we have richer um, information on performance context, on activities. Uh, that public aspect of the CRA uh, is extraordinarily uh, valuable and is one of the things that provides oxygen to that community development ecosystem that I was talking about earlier. Governor, I want to thank you first for your study, your research, and your emphasis on these issues that are very, very important to not us, but every community in our country. And uh, you've really, really been a great advocate, so we want to thank you for that. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to ask about uh, national funds. As we talk about uh, expanding the approach for banks in these areas where they do have a preponderance of uh, lending or a preponderance of deposits, their ability to contribute to national funds, both for uh, mortgage backs as well as small business backed um, um, securities, is very important. Yet there was a part of the Q&A uh, and a part of the uh, proposed rulemaking that spoke to giving less credit to investment in those funds. Uh, less credit than, say, a direct loan uh, or a uh, direct situation where um, you know, you're, you're making the connection not through a fund but through some other form of security. We want to emphasize, I want to emphasize, that that marketplace of liquidity and that marketplace of demand would be indelibly hurt if, uh, the, if you give less credit to an investment in a national fund. The credit has to be the same so that we're able to create, as you said, more 
but also a robust marketplace in which uh, the, the, the banks don't have to be concerned about whether they get credit for that kind of investment. Uh, and uh, the Community Capital Trust is an example of that, but so are the tax credit funds and so are some of the funds run by the uh, national intermediaries. So I like your comments on that and thank you again for all your great work. Well, thank you, and uh, it's certainly something uh, that we received uh, comments on, we've heard about in some of our uh, roundtables, um, and I think it is one of those issues um, that uh, needs to be uh, judged uh, carefully. Um, I think there's a balance to be struck there, um, and so it is one of the things uh, that we're looking at. It's um, an area that I don't have a really good answer for you uh, because it is... Um, uh, again, there's a kind of balancing act there uh, in terms of how much credit uh, and whether that credit uh, should be comparable or whether there might be some circumstances that would lead one to differentiate. Uh, but it is certainly something that we're looking at. Um, and again, you know, I'm hoping uh, that we will uh, move forward with a set of proposals um, and we'll continue to engage uh, as we kind of uh, uh, refine some of those specific areas that we received comments on. Any others? All right, thank you very much.